Hi. Hello. Uh, I'm Erica Gregory, and I'm the director of an initiative called the N Square Collaborative, which was the brainchild of five major foundations who thought that it was important to spark and support innovation in the field of nuclear arms control. And we're specifically doing that by building collaborative networks of nuclear subject matter experts, creatives like yourselves, technology folks, financiers, and others who are interested in making a difference on this issue. And the foundations involved are the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Skoll Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and one of our co-hosts for this evening and our friends at the Plowshares Fund. One of the first things we did when we started this initiative was to forge a partnership with Hollywood Health and Society, which I think many of you know is a program of the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center. And we did that because we knew, that's good, applause is fine. <laughs> uh, we knew that the Hollywood Health and Society program shared our belief in the ability for popular media, uh, television and film in particular, to shape culture and to change minds about important social issues. Hollywood Health and Society serves as a free resource for writers, producers, and others in search of accurate information on health, safety, and security topics. In addition to consulting on the threat of nuclear weapons, uh, Hollywood Health and Society also deals with a vast array of topics such as cybersecurity, clinical trials, maternal health, reproductive health, HIV, aging, chronic illness, disability, and more. Hollywood Health and Society recognizes the profound impact that entertainment media has on individual knowledge and behavior and offers several resources like consultations, in-person expert interviews, tip sheets, panel events, and screenings like this one tonight to reach the entertainment industry and the broader public with timely and important information. Together, N Square Collaborative and Hollywood Health and Society have developed a program to bring nuclear threats experts to writers' rooms across Hollywood, such as the Madam Secretary team. And profound thanks go to Barbara Hall and David Gray and their really exceptional team of writers for having the social consciences and the vision to produce an episode like the one you're about to see. Along with, by the way, six million other people who watched the episode on Sunday night, including, I happen to know, a special advisor to the president of Rwanda who says she watches the show to learn how to do her job. <laughs> For this show, Hollywood Health and Society, uh, the show you're about to see this evening, this episode, Hollywood Health and Society has arranged multiple consultancies with illustrious experts in the nuclear threat reduction field, including former Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz, the founder of Global Zero, Bruce Blair, Joseph Serencioni and Jeffrey Lewis, both of whom are on the panel this evening and you'll have a chance to talk to. But that's not all. <laughs> In rapid response to the news that this episode would air last Sunday, together with Hollywood Health and Society and a team of collaborators across the nuclear threats field, we created a live social media campaign that trended on Twitter for two hours on Sunday and continues today. We thought it was pretty good. Uh, really, if you take the Golden State Warriors, which had three hashtags in the top ten, we think that we were in the top seven. <laughs> Yesterday, former Secretary Moniz and David Gray hosted a Reddit Ask Me Anything that had more than 6,000 participants and covered everything from mutually assured destruction to thorium mining, about which I have to say I didn't learn very much because, really, that is a tough one. Clearly, an awful lot of people are paying very close attention to these issues. Tonight, after the screening, we'll hear from a great lineup of panelists whose impressive bios are in your hands, in your packets. Uh, the discussion is going to be streamed on Facebook Live on the Hollywood Health and Society page. And everyone is welcome and encouraged to tweet and retweet, along with tonight's event, using the hashtag at Madam Secretary. If after the episode you find yourself wondering, gee, what would I have done if I were in their shoes? 
you should check out a new online game from our friends at Playmatics, the Center for Security Studies at the University of Maryland, and Public Radio International. It gives you five minutes to decide what to do. It's called Nuclear Decisions, and it's at nucleardecisions.org. So thank you to Plowshares. Thank you again to David and Barbara. And thank you to the team at Hollywood Health and Society for your extraordinary efforts. Uh, and Madam Secretary bringing this compelling topic to the television screen. So here we go with the season four finale episode, which is titled Night Watch. What an amazing episode. That's the third time, actually, that I've watched it. And I have to say, every time there are so many details and every line is like, I'm like, oh, that has a purpose. What was the purpose of that line? What was the purpose of the what color is my tie? Like everything. Um, but we're going to talk tonight about some of the larger themes and larger issues. And so I just want to say also, Plowshares Fund, our mission is the elimination of nuclear weapons. And so <laughs> thank you. So for us, you know, this is an issue that uh, some of us have spent years working on, some have spent decades working on. And to see this issue come to light in a show like this, with this kind of platform, is amazing. And it could not co have come at a better time. So thank you for, for that. Um, our panel tonight, we have two nuclear experts, uh, Joe Serencioni, who is the president of Plowshares Fund. Uh, exactly. You. He's also an MSNBC contributor. You would have seen him and heard him many, many times in the media. And he is the author of several books, including Nuclear Nightmares. It's a uh, romance novel. Yeah, <laughs> great bedtime reading. Uh, Jeffrey Lewis, next up, is the director of the East Asian Nonproliferation Program at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Mouthful. So he is also one of the foremost experts on nuclear weapons with specific expertise in North Korea. And for those of you that haven't heard his podcast, little plug here, armscontrolwonk.com. Don't be fooled, it's not a .org. Um, <laughs> geek out. Go listen to it. Every issue you could imagine about nuclear weapons and issues, it is awesome. Uh, Barbara Hall, the incredibly talented creator and producer. Yay. Madam Secretary. <laughs> And David Gray, who is also the executive producer of Madam Secretary. Uh, so I also want to welcome our Facebook Live audience out there. I believe we have some viewers. Um, so with that, let's turn to the panel. Um, Barbara, I want to start with you. And I want to ask you, I've, also, I've heard this from you before, but I wonder if you would share your vision for the show. Uh, you know, it's first and foremost entertainment, but you have so embraced this opportunity with this platform. And, um, and I know you have some particular intentions around, even though it's a political drama, staying nonpartisan. So can you talk about some of those things that are important to you as you created this show? Um, sure. Uh, when I was first approached uh, by um, Lori McCreary and Morgan Freeman at, the, at Revelations about, and CBS, about doing a show about a female secretary of state, um, I, it was, let's say, you know, five years, if you count the development of it, five years ago. And even five years ago, I thought, you know, um, it would be, I won't only want to do this if I can create a political show where we, where everybody's invited to the political discussion again. Um, so that a place where we can talk about politics in a way that's, um, not so polarized and polarizing. Uh, and at the time, <laughs> if you can imagine, <laughs> at the time it seemed like that was a high goal. Um, and so I thought, well, there are a couple of things going for this show in that way. One is that she is Secretary of State, which means we would be do doing stories about foreign relations and international issues. And, um, and really it's a problem solving show. It's about, you know, their international problems. And then we pull back the, the curtain a little bit on the State Department and show how those problems are solved and how policy is done and how process is done, which is something that, um, we haven't seen a lot of with the State Department anyway. So, um, and then the question is, will, will this be interesting to people? <laughs> and, um, and then once we sort of got into it, we realized, yes, this is, the, this is uh, taking people into seeing how 
what the process is in diplomacy and solving international relations um, is enough of a story and an interesting enough story that we really can sort of um, pull everyone into the discussion and keep it um, nonpartisan. And it was sort of our goal to wait as long as we could to identify political parties, and then we realized, oh, I don't think we ever have to identify political parties. Mm -hmm. And we haven't until we made uh, Dalton run for an election as an independent. Part of the, the um, mission statement for this show, too, is that it's an aspirational drama about, about politics. I mean, we, we don't want to sugarcoat anything. We want to show all, all the problems as they are. But then we want to sort of move in a direction of people wanting to solve these problems in, in, in a way um, that they are civil servants and their, their common goal is, is, is one of, you know, um, finding solutions for everybody that work for everybody. Um, so, um, you know, we were able to sort of do that and, um, and sort of create, the, again, this world where uh, people, everyone is invited to the political discussion. And um, it's interesting that, you know, sometimes people can't even tell which, you know, whether this is a right wing or a left wing argument. And the nuclear, sh the nuclear episode was a, a, a good um, place to do that, a good form for that, too. So, you know, David, I hear that this was something, there was kind of a bug in your ear about this nuclear theme for a while. So can you tell us a little bit about this particular episode? Why this issue? Why now? How did this develop? Yeah, you know, as, as far as I could remember, I think the bug, I think there were two bugs, Joe and Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, because Bugged Ro you a lot. Roberta s said, oh, you should meet these guys and and wow what a, what an honor uh and they came into the writer's room and and talked about this issue and we thought well that could be maybe an exciting episode um and and barbara had some concerns about it um i think she calls it terror porn <laughs> sorry to steal your line that's your line uh and she was concerned about that uh and um and there's also the concern of well you you start off but you know, is everyone gonna know? It's it, you know, it's it's is it? You know, we call it a wank in writing. <laughs> like, is it like? Oh well, they, but then we figured out sort of a way to play with time that, that was kind of fun. And and the and the way that and I, I, Barbara and I each have a slightly different point of view of how we got to actually doing this episode because the, Barbara just said, "No, we're not doing it." And I said, <laughs> "Okay," and I, and I was actually a little relieved um, because I, cause again, inherently there are problems. Like, because once you get past the crisis. It's, it felt very, just conceptually, it felt a little bit dry um, dealing with this policy issue. But then Barbara had the idea to separate Elizabeth from the crisis. And part of that was, I'm, I don't need to speak for, oh, was that she didn't want to put, <laughs> she thought if you put our main character through that, all the way through it, instead of just that last piece that you saw, that it would be might be too much for the audience. It's uh, and well, she humanizes it. I mean, you yes. see her with her family. There's definitely there's a strong humanization in her reaction to it, having not been in this in that cons consultation. Yes, and then what really saves uh, saves, but how, the reason I think, in as much as the back half of the episode works, it's the it's the emotion that comes out of having experienced thinking even for a few minutes that perhaps you were seeing your children for the last time and that all the characters have and then getting to dramatize the they, they really call I remember the first time I heard that the inner sanctum at the Pentagon is called the nuclear priesthood mm -hmm. um, that's how they're referred to um, that they're just set in their ways and anyway so dramatizing that um, and anyway glad we got to do it well one of the one of the jokes between us because this really this discussion did go on for like a year you know we had started halfway through the last season right and I kept saying well um, part of why you I didn't want to do it is the research <laughs> thanks guys <laughs> um, <laughs> having to live there and then you know to write something you have to live it you have to imagine it and I didn't I mean, we're all kind of going through some stressful <laughs> times, and I wasn't sure I wanted to put myself through that. It was a little bit selfish, and so the joke between us was, all right, well, uh, as long as I can write the scenes where that aren't about the nuclear crisis, <laughs> and then we're like, well, what would those scenes be? And then it suddenly came to us, what if Elizabeth is not in it? And then what if, it does that make it a, in an even more powerful story that we juxtapose it with everyday life to give everybody a, a real understanding of this could be happening while you're at the grocery store and you'll never know about it? 
Um, and in fact, has almost happened um, while we were at the grocery store and we didn't know about it for a long time. So um, that was sort of the way we, we um, found our way to do th this, the episode. Uh, okay, so Jeffrey and Joe, unpack that whole scene, that first scene where they find that the missiles are flying, that there are missiles incoming from Russia. Like, who gets consulted? How does this go down in real life? How much time do they really have? Is it really called Night Watch? Like, all those details. The code names vary, but this was a remarkably accurate depiction. Uh, you you did your research. You you <laughs> did you did your research. This this was quite detailed, and it could happen just out of the blue, just like this, just like you depicted it. Everything's going along and fine. And suddenly, there's a crisis, and it follows almost exactly that that path. When it's the military, you know, the military gets called first, and then they alert the the National Security Council. They alert the the, the president, and there is an officer following the president around 24 hours a day, seven days a week, carrying the football, the nuclear codes that you saw. And that it's that officer's duty to stay within a minute of the president at all, the t all times. So if the president's playing golf, this officer is in the golf cart behind him. When the president gets on the elevator, this officer gets in the elevator with him. Th th that's, that's the way it works. And the president has the absolute unfettered authority to launch his weapons. One of the most interesting things about this, then I'll hand it over to you, is when they're in the helicopter or, or, and then the plane and they're discussing this, you see that he's asking people's opinion, but he's not asking approval. There's, there's two people required every step of the way in this process except the decision itself. And then it's the president and the president alone who has the authority. And once that president decides, no one can overrule him. As one of the characters says, there's no turning back now. Yeah, I, you know, the thing that I loved so much about that episode was that you finally undid the thing that I hate about movies about nuclear weapons, which is, you know, in every movie about nuclear weapons, there's... 30 minutes for people to argue <laughs> about it. <laughs> and the president needs a second vote, and so he's trying to strong arm some other idiot and going into Armageddon with him. Um, and like none of that's true. And, and one of the most interesting things uh, as, as somebody who does this professionally is, you know, when you explain to people that, oh, no, 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 there's no second vote, and, and the whole posture is designed to be done at once. Yes. You know, it's not... It is literally this idea that if we see all of these Russian missiles coming over, and I actually really should say all these Soviet yes. missiles because oh, yes. it is it is that posture, that you know the president is going to need to make this decision in a matter of minutes, and that order needs to go all the way out so that our missiles can be up and out of the silos before, before theirs hit. get here, yeah. right? And so so that's really the posture, and there is no second vote, and the president only has to use the little the little code to, to authorize, right? That just to confirm it's his voice. You know? And you know, when you tell people that that's the posture, they're like, ah no, that's crazy. But they don't believe you. Uh, I can't tell a, you how many arguments I have over like drinks that. about this. People do not believe you. Or they believe if the president would give this order to say the military would no. overrule them. Yeah, no, so that's not the way it's set up. This is civilian control of the military. They drill this just as you saw. Boom. Once they get the order, they drill. And this is what they do over and over and over it's again. Precision. Until it's as automatic as down. it can be and still involve humans. Yeah, there, there was just, the, the, you might have noticed that the second officer in the launch center, the silo, said, oh, he said, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Agreed. And that was, you know, in researching this, and we were, I think Bruce Blair, uh, who I'd be remiss not mentioning, such an incredible expert. A lot of people consider him the foremost expert on this issue. Who was a control um, officer in a Minuteman silo. He, he was, yeah, a missileer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's, he found us a video of, of two launch officers drilling. And it was that, the oh. creepiness of the one officer is saying, okay, let's get out the keys. I agree. It's authenticate the codes. I agree. It's, it's a script. It's rote. 
Um, and one other interesting detail I just want to mention. Just have it, I, well, I you're geeked really out. Wonking I geeked this out on good. the details. No, <laughs> is that I? Always, what do you think's in the nuclear football? Oh. What I always thought is you open it up and it's it's a computer and you turn some dials and you launch like you literally program it in. Okay, we're gonna launch. Right. And no, the way that I think it was one of you guys, Bruce or Secretary Meniz or one of you guys, yeah. explained to me, it's like a bunch of Denny's menus. <laughs> it's like a, and yeah, they say, exactly okay, right. here's how we attack North Korea. Here's how we attack Pakistan. Right. Here's how we attack Russia. Here's how we attack China. Oh, and ma and and I think I, I was on the phone with Bruce Blair, and he said, "Yeah, it's a major attack option one, major attack option two, major attack option three. I said, "Wait a second, is it really called major attack option <laughs> one? Just like, really? It sounds like it's out of Doctor Strange Love." Um, so any anyway, sorry. Well, and who else did you con you consulted Ernie Moniz? So yes. So what were er some of the things you learned there? Ernie, well. The main thing I learned, one of the main things I learned from all four of these guys <laughs> is that once a missile is launched, it can't be, sh there's no way right. it could be shot down by anything on Earth. And we really, I really wanted the teaser out to be we actually launch. Oh. And I was like, okay, guys, I, 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 come on, guys, is there any way, any scenario? No. <laughs> yeah, hold the phone. Right. So, right, so, so this is what he, what, Jeffrey's talking about in Mission Impossible 2 or 3, you know, Tom Cruise tries to stop the launch and fails, and the missile launches, and then he hacks into the missile and, and destroys it. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> there is no that. There is no... Their design, obviously, you do not want your enemy hacking into your missile, so there is no self-destruct. There is no way to do it. There's no way to reliably intercept right, I these missiles. I asked that. If you, if, is there any command and control once I it's remember. launched? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it po and there isn't because we don't want the enemy to be like you said. Yeah. Okay, so uh, they're sitting in the Oval Office after the crisis, and Elizabeth basically says it's you know the problem is this fifty-year-old posture, and it's the policy itself, the policy of having these missiles on hair trigger alert. So, um, Joe and Jeffrey, can you just articulate a little bit about what is the problem with that policy? Well, so the, the fundamental problem with the policy is that it's not designed to be thought about. It's a thing that's designed to be done. And it, it is literally designed to exclude anyone thinking. I, I think one of the things I loved about the, about the, the, the show was, uh, you know, you worked hard to give yourself the ability to abort the mission because it's actually not possible, except for you've created this wonderful moment where it's like, well, if they violated the procedure a little, then you might be able to catch up. But generally speaking, this is, this is done so that when there is a crisis, you pick off the menu. The president doesn't get to go, well, maybe this target, no, maybe not that target. No, 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 no. You pick one, and that's it. Right? You pick the one, and then they do the whole thing. And so if you imagine that you live in this era, in which we do, in which we all know that computers, you make mistakes. Human beings are fallible. Um, you know, the situation that you imagine that you're preparing for in real life, it turns out it's slightly different. You know, it just, it is utterly contrary to everything I know about people. So whenever anybody asks me, like, why do I think our nuclear posture is crazy? I, I always say, well, have you met the humans? <laughs> 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 and so this concentrated, I don't know how long it was, five minutes, six minutes in the Oval Office, I think that was the best scripted debate about this policy that I have ever seen on this subject. And, and, and the reason is because you have very strong arguments on both sides. And this is exactly how it goes down you know, in extended debate over, over the decades and in, 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 in debate on, the, on, the, in, in this, the, the Congress over this and how it would go down in the room. In fact, I think I remember talking to you, David, and talking about the, the, the alert policy. And you said, well, wh wh who would object to de-alerting? And, and, and we said, well, he here's why. And you, and you nailed it. As, and and the, the Secretary of Defense, by the way, that's the only quibble I have with this program. This, the, in actual life, the, the real Secretary of Defense would never deign to come to the State Department. <laughs> 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 and originally in the script, she went to him. Well, exactly. But, but budget-wise, we couldn't afford to build that set, uh, so we had to be on our standing set. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, you know, I, I will not shred any part of our new military superiority. And that is exactly how they feel about everything. So every debate, we absolutely need this weapon. We absolutely need this posture. And, and for you 
to, to argue against it, senator or secretary of state, you are weakening America. You are threatening America. And that is exactly how they feel. They're good, solid, patriotic Americans, and this is their position. And they, this is the one, they don't give up. They, and they usually win. Okay, I'm, t I'm going to take the liberty before we turn to Q&A for one final question. Um, there was a, So one of the things Plowshares is looking at now is this deeply gendered way that we um, approach and think about and frame our national security and foreign policies. And there were some really interesting references that you had in this episode to all of that, right? Just the reference to Elizabeth having an, you know, an emotional moment. And she just profoundly defends that, saying, no, in fact, we need more emotion in our policy, and calling her the Dalton Whisperer and the, the priesthood. So can you just talk a little bit about, was that intentional? Was, you know, like, how did you include that? Because that, I think, is really important. And I also noticed a lot of kind of familiar laughing, and, and just there was a sense from the audience that that connected. Um, I'm going to let David answer these questions because David wrote that scene, which I thought was amazing. And um, when we were, you know, in our separate offices writing our scenes, he kept walking, my, knocking on my door and saying, this scene is going to be like five pages long. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it should be, it should be. It, it, you know, everything in there, and he, another, you know, couple hours have passed, knock, knock, knock. It's really five pages long. I mean, it's full on five pages long. So um, I, I want to, you know, because uh, that is, you know, the strength of all those arguments. And having the discussion that brings both of the arguments to the discussion. Humanizing it and bringing the, the morality it. And, of these um, weapons. But I would like to say a man wrote that line. Uh. <laughs> a man wrote that scene. <laughs> well, thanks, Barbara. A man wrote that line who is inspired by a woman <laughs> who, who created a show about... Um, women having you know, a, a woman, women, a woman in a man's world. I mean, that is the the pilot uh, of Madam Secretary. A and yeah, I mean, the I, I, again, like I said earlier, I was surprised by the idea of the priesthood, which isn't just men. We had Ellen Hill, the National Security Advisor, in on that. Um, and yeah, and and again, the yeah, it was an opportunity to say, well, you're a man, to have a man tell. Leone, you're being emotional, um, but then her leaning into it uh, felt dramatic. Uh, you know, so in, in a scene like that, you want to get out uh, the policy arguments, but you want to do it in an emotional way, in a way that you know we wanted. We always want Elizabeth Taya to have drive, have personal drive, and and st and, uh, and to connect emotionally um, in the scenes. I um, thought it was so great the way that da David really found the way to say. Uh, you know, this is a decision that perhaps we should bring some emotion to. The idea that of di divorcing emotion from all of our policy decisions is is um, lunacy. And um, so, so we need spokespeople, David. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and I, I I'll just add um, when Joe was talking about the um, about uh, you know the sides of the art, both sides of the argument. I am um, our um, we have consul terrific consultants that are on retainer for the show, political consultants in, in DC. And we every episode for our scripts, for production, you know, where does the flag go for a treaty signing, everything, would they, you know, they, they vet our scripts and we ask them a lot of questions. Um, and interestingly, when we raised the idea, hey, we're thinking of doing this episode um, about de-awarding nuclear weapons, I didn't realize that they, um, a couple of them worked at the Pentagon, and they were like, "No, nah, no one cares about that. Don't do that." It's, um, and so it, it was interesting. There, you know, that Pentagon mentality, and um, but they gave us, you know, their side of, of it. And I reached out. I was in touch with Bruce Blair a lot, emailing a lot, because he really the details of what goes on, you know, in that in that new in the launch center. Yes. And uh, and I sent him an email saying, "Hey, listen, you know, we, I just want to make sure we're not unfair." to the other side of the argument. This side for, you know, let's let's not deal with it. And he wrote back, really? You worried about being unfair <laughs> to, to the Pentagon with an $800 billion budget, to Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Raytheon, the military industrial complex, and we're a ragtag group of like academics, you know, getting paid nothing. You're really worried about being unfair. Yeah. But we tried to be fair. That's great. Just, just on that, this is one line, I love you for putting this in, 
there really is an ICBM caucus. Yeah. And again, people don't believe you. This is like 12 senators from states where they have ICBMs and bomber bases, and they care about the contracts, and they care about the jobs, and they resist reductions, and they, they had a big role in President Obama's uh, New START treaty. They stopped him from going lower because it would have meant cutting the ICBMs. A really good friend of mine was the executive director of that caucus. <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> I'm glad you're. F oh, and by the way, one last thing. <laughs> this really is man. a bipartisan issue, then I'll just shut up. <laughs> you know, both President Obama, when campaigning, uh, and, and George Bush, when campaigning, pledged to end this de alerting practice. It's a bipartisan. They both said, This is crazy, we're going to stop it, and they both failed because they ran into this resistance. Okay, on that note, I want to open it up to a couple questions. My question is actually to the foundations, is that this theory that you can take a moment and make a movement is actually inverted. It's really about investing in the moment, in the movements, so that we can take advantage of moment. Mm. And so I'm just wondering, because I, I work for Physicians for Social Responsibility and I've seen sort of the decimation of, of non, DC grassroots organizing groups that actually are also movement organizations. So if you could speak to that. Oh, well, see, I, I, we were literally having this conversation this very day um, because I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we do have this idea that something terrible will happen and people will suddenly go like, oh, this is crazy. But the thing is, something terrible has already happened. You know, this, this episode roughly replicates the experience of the training tape incident in the 1970s. And when that happened, people were shocked and there was a declassification and it turns out there had been a number of false alarms. Uh, that the new computer systems that went online in the 1970s were incredibly glitchy. Um, so much so that uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, President Carter's national security advisor, um, you know, got a call in the middle of the night one night uh, and he was prepared to call President Carter and tell him to do this. And, and he made the decision not to wake up his wife uh, because he didn't want her to know. And so we lived through that and we didn't do anything about it, right? That's 40 years ago and we have the same posture. So I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I'm grateful to people like Joe who, you know, fund people like me. Uh, and, and, and actually does fund quite a lot of, of those groups, uh, uh, many of the grassroots groups, and I guess I'll let you talk about that. Um, but you're absolutely right. Like, if you don't put in the work, then, then that moment is, is, is nothing, and it just passes. No, you said it very well. I don't, I don't think I have much to add. You can say nice things about your grantees. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a retainer for this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm wait, waiting to get a, uh, David's retainer that he's talking about. The, the, no, th th this is a remarkable moment where so much is happening in our own country and around the world, and you see people rising up to, to respond to this. And it, you know, whether it's the, w the women's movement or the, the immigration movement, the civil rights movement, now a gun control movement that seemingly sprang out of nowhere, but it didn't spring out of nowhere. And so you have millions of people more engaged, more, more involved in politics and in policy than you've seen since the 1980s. And I think the, the, your, your theme that you struck at the end uh, is right. You, ha this is, you have to get the people engaged. It's the only way you're yeah. going to break the politics. And, and the only, th and good point, but the only, I'll be a little bit, I'll push back a little bit, I'll be a little defensive. The difference, and we're an aspirational television show, but the, no, but, but the difference is that this went further, the president actu actually ordered retaliation. And the difference in the world of the show is that the leader of the free world, the president of the United States, a good person, said we need to do this and led the way on the show. In a month, I grant you, quick, aspirational show. And, and so I, I would just say that in the world of our show, like it, it's, you can't necessarily compare it to a, a reality that's a, a little milder. But I, anyway. I was hoping we'd get like a nine part season dedicated to the <laughs> development of the de-alerting treaty. We could do more panels. There's the ratification debate and... Yeah, that'll be the arc at the beginning of <laughs> season five. <laughs> okay, next question. I think in the back there. 
Hi. Hi. Yeah, I wonder uh, what other countries do other nuclear weapons powers do to reduce the odds of a mistake and to buy their decision makers more time? Right. So the Russians do the same thing we do, which is insane. Um, and pretty much everyone else thinks that that's insane. So the Chinese don't do that. Uh, and and The Indians don't do this. And the, the Indians Pakistan. don't do it. The Pakistanis probably don't oh. do it. Uh, you know, the closest thing that you get is that the... Uh, no, no, they don't. You know, a, almost everyone else keeps their nuclear warheads off alert. The exception would be with uh, submarines. Um, but even in the case of submarines, people are very secretive about how ready they are. Uh, you know, we know the most about the British, who are, you know, the most transparent. And those are on uh, what they say, days notice to fire. There's two aspects to this. One, they're not on alert. And also, I don't think, besides Russia, do other countries have sole authority to launch? I think most of them have consultative processes. Yeah, well, it's hard to know because they, 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 um, they don't talk. But really, I mean, this is really a U.S.-Russia phenomenon. Uh, and this really, it, it emerges from this fear that one side is going to launch all of their missiles and then the other side has to hurry up and launch all of their missiles before those missiles get here. And, and when you get locked into that kind of competition, you then get locked into these rigid timelines. Everyone else has looked at that and said, that seems kind of crazy. Okay. Hey, very good work. Um, and I see Mr. Serencione on TV all the time. You're very good, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, question for you. What is it like having a show on general market network television dealing with politics and uh, a, a political administration that is so s much stranger than the one you've created? The one you've created is... <laughs> is, you know, they're rational, reasonable, serious people who are about governing what, whatever their feelings are. They're about that. We have a whole different thing. For instance, in your episode, it would be John Bolton, right? <laughs> Which is just a strange, it's just a strange group of people. What is it like <laughs> uh, doing a, a, a show that's supposedly set in reality when our reality is stranger than reality? That's a good, good question. question. Um, you know, our show has spanned two, uh, many enormous things, but two enormous things. One is the election. So we, our show came on during the Obama uh, administration. We had an actual election in our show, and, um, and then we lived through the election. Um, you know, you have to, and then the other big thing we lived through uh, uh, that our show span was the Me Too movement. So, um, and one thing that I would say about addressing how quickly things move these days, um, a, and I will, that's part of my answer to your question, the big change that made for us is that things seem to move at one pace before the election, things feel like they move at another pace after the election. Um, one of the things that we get a pass on in a way is that, you know, you have to decide what your reality is when you create a show that could be happening real time. And we decided that the show, uh, was about one election cycle and one year in the future. So all of the presidents that we've had, including Obama, had been elected, and then the next person who was elected was Conrad Dalton. So after this election, we automatically went into a parallel universe because this never happened in our world. Um, and that's been, you know, that's been interesting to try to sort of stay true to our world and the politics of our world. Um, and, uh, you know, we used to try to stay a little ahead of the news. We would have, like, uh, situations that were starting to be discussed. We would game them out to the most dramatic conclusion, and, and then sometimes that would also happen. For example, we had a, a, a peace agreement with Iran about, a, a, about 10 months before the actual nuclear agreement with Iran was signed. Yours is still in uh, Ours is still intact. <laughs> we, we, we did. <laughs> they did an episode. We did an episode. We did an episode about going into phase two, and um, we, we kept our uh, agreement intact. But that's what it's like. It's, it's in a way, it's like uh, the two biggest challenges are trying to stay ahead of the news and not just get fully behind it. So the story that we're telling is antiquated. Um, and the other is to sort of stay grounded in what hasn't happened in our world of politics. Uh, in the purple sweater right here. Oh, okay. um, I am. I I started watching your show a little bit after the the 2016 election. And I was just like so grateful for it, <laughs> and knowing that um, probably a lot of your audience 
I mean, television is where people get their social studies now. I mean, we, we have to admit it, and we have a responsibility. I am wondering, um, given that you've probably been on other shows where you sit and you live tweet with the audience and interact with your fans, what is your engagement or, or your fan mail like <laughs> from your, your audience? Because it is uh, uh, more mature, maybe more flyover state type stuff, and this is, this is all they're getting if they're not re if they're not watching anything other than a certain news show. Thank you. Well, we we talk a lot about the fact that this show gives us the opportunity to teach civics lessons, um, but you know at the same time entertaining. And so that's the line we have to walk because you can't give people spinach; they won't stay with you. Um, but but you know we're always sort of gauging how interested people are in our discussions. How wonky can we be? And you know people will go a long way with you. People find this subject interesting, and. Um, and so, you know, in terms of engagement, we find the most interesting thing we find, and I'm going to let you add anything that I might be forgetting, is that we do seem to have a bipartisan audience. We do seem to have bring everybody to the party, um, and um, that to, I think that's one of our great advantages right now. Yeah, we I and mean, one of Barbara's mandates is that we're not we try not to be very issuey, and when we take a side on an issue, it's like we we just say well. We think uh, Secretary McCord would be for de-alerting. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's an American issue. It's uh, it's about national security, and it is a but there is bipartisan agreement on both sides of it. I mean, there, um, Henry Kissinger and George Shultz are part of the Four Horsemen, who, and they are they are therefore de-alerting, um, and so uh, along with Sam Nunn and uh, William Bill Perry, Perry, William Perry, so. You know, we when we do take a side, it's not a, a red or a blue side. It's not a Democratic or Republican side. It's simply a national security side. Okay, I, one one more question. <laughs> Sorry, they already gave me the mic. So I'm <laughs> there, that's you. <laughs> um, first of all, I would say stay wonky because um, <laughs> yeah, I have three young nieces, high school, first year of college. They watch the show all the time. They've just discovered West Wing. They're binging on that. <laughs> they take it into school with them. They learn. It's very important. Um, my question is, was it before, during, or after when you wrote this episode that the whole incident in Hawaii went down? And, and to you gentlemen, how, what did that incident, how did that in some act impact you? I'm going to quickly answer your wonk question or your statement because I want to say just, I would say four or five people that I know, or I actually don't know, have them, you know, some I do and some I don't. Anyway, these emails come to me of people who tell me that their daughters are entering college to study international relations because of this show. Wow. And those are just the people I know about. So um, I think it's pretty great. So Yeah, Hawaii actually happened after we were already talking about doing this episode and it only it, it's funny because it's not perfectly analogous but it feels like it is um and so it did make us feel better about it um we're sorry it happened we're <laughs> not yeah you know those poor you know poor people in hawaii getting the crap scared out of them um but um but uh but but yeah um i think that that answers it <laughs> well I, the thing i would want to say about the false alarm in hawaii is it's very interesting to me to watch how people react to these false alarms because the general reaction is, well, we should fire that person and never have false alarms. <laughs> if you are going to have nuclear weapons and warning systems, you are going to have terrifying false alarms. That is the deal you were cutting. And, and what I, one thing I loved about the episode, you know, is there was a real recognition that we have had these kinds of false alarms in the past and mm -hmm. it is we consistently encounter these things that are not possible, but that still happen. You know, and for me, the one that really always sticks out, which isn't really, it's not exactly a false alarm, but it's a perfect example where, you know, uh, I guess it's now maybe about 10 years ago, there, were, uh, there, was, uh, there was a bomber that was gonna fly from one base to another, and it was supposed to carry empty cruise missiles, yeah. but half of them were nuclear-armed cruise missiles, uh, and the reason is because they did it on a Thursday before Labor Day. And everybody was looking forward to the three-day weekend. And, and, and so when it happened, people said it's not possible. And in fact, the, the commander of the base that got them 
when the staff came in and said, we have six unsecured nuclear weapons sitting on, on the runway, he was like, no, we don't. Go back and check again. Right? And, and so one of the things I loved about the episode and the thing I think I take from Hawaii is you cannot eliminate false alarms. If you have nuclear weapons and you have warning systems, you are going to run that risk forever and you just have to decide how long you think your luck will hold out. Just, just two quick things. So, yeah, so in that e episode of the, the nuclear armed cruise missiles, so they were on the plane on the tarmac, tarmac, tarmac for 36 hours. And that was guarded by a, a, the normal security and a barbed wire fence. The really scary part is the storage unit back in North Dakota did not know they were missing. You know, huh? And everybody thought this was impossible. There were six different checks that that was supposed to be done that they missed it. Um, in, international security studies. I'm delighted that people are going into this. Both Jeffrey and I teach. Um, I, I, at the graduate level on international security. Jeffrey at Middlebury Institute and I'm at, at Georgetown University. And last, uh, last uh, this semester, one of the people I brought in to talk to my seminar was Daniel Ellsberg, who has just written a great book, uh, and uh, Madeleine Albright, who has been on your show. Uh, but, but Daniel Ellsberg has written a book called The Doomsday Machine about his experiences as a, uh, a nuclear policy analyst in the early 1960s, and he goes through these all, you know, all, all these these incidents. And one of the things he then draws in the show is that we didn't know then about nuclear winter, which you reference quickly in the show, which is real. And the the reality is that if Russia actually did launch this, even as few as a few hundred warheads, I think you end up at a, a thousand or so coming in, that destroys Russia, even though it hits us. What happens is it puts enough smoke and particulate in the, in the atmosphere that it covers the earth in a cloud cover for two to three years, dropping temperatures two to three degrees and killing a healthy percentage of the food crops in the world. So this is a suicide gesture, doing either one. So Dalton actually didn't have to launch. You know, th the Russians have done it for it, and it works both ways. If we go first and do this, we're killing ourselves. This is it's not mutually assured destruction. It's a suicidal gesture for people to launch these numbers of nuclear weapons. Well, on that cheery note. <laughs> <laughs> you see why I didn't want to do this episode. I know, I know. <laughs> I work with this every day. Um, so I just want to, in closing, give a shout out to the um, Hollywood Health and Society team. <laughs> to N Square for nurturing this relationship and making the episode happen. The Writers Guild of America for lending us the space. And just a reminder, uh, definitely explore the interactive that Erica mentioned. It's nucleardecisions.org. Good. Um, it is actually really fascinating. There is that five minutes goes really fast, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, and reminder too, if you want to get wonky with Jeffrey Lewis, armscontrolwonk.com, and you can always learn more about the work that we're doing at Plowshares at plowshares.org. With that, please join me in thanking our panel. Thanks for coming. <laughs>